What if you could learn to benefit from real life tools that expand your faith and widen your perspective to see new possibilities for your life? Well, let me invite you to join us for our Word on Investing Summit, Money, Faith, and Mindset. It's a live virtual event. At the summit, you'll spend two days with world-renowned Christian business leaders and million-dollar entrepreneurs like myself, the Benham Brothers, Dr. Myron Golden, and many others from the comfort of your own home. We'll be speaking on how your mindset, your walk with the Lord, and understanding economic principles from the Bible are the keys to unlocking your next level of financial potential. If you're looking to find a renewed sense of purpose in your financial and spiritual life, and make no mistake, they are connected, make sure to grab your ticket to the Word on Investing Virtual Summit happening April 22nd and 23rd, 2022, because registration will close soon. Get your free ticket at tradeway.com summit. That's tradeway.com slash summit. Hey guys, I'm David Mitchell, founder and CEO of Tradeway. What if God himself gave you a blueprint for how to handle your money? Well, the Bible is a practical book. Let's dive in and see what it has to say about wealth, about risk, about leverage, and about investing, and uncover how trading in the stock market can be a powerful tool for moving towards your biggest goals. We're so happy you're here. This is The Word on Investing. Hey guys, welcome back to our podcast. Hey, I'm excited about today because we're finishing up a two-part series today, an interview with David and Lori Benham. Now, if you missed yesterday, please go check it out because yesterday we talked about the Benham family story, which is quite amazing. It's kind of a story of persecution in modern day America. So you need to check that one out. This family has achieved so much in the business world, but also in ministry. And I'm so glad you're here today because we're going to sit down and chat with Lori Benham specifically about a business that she started and the steps that she took to start that business. Lori, I'm so glad to have you on with us today. Welcome back to the show. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. You bet. Well, guys, let me recap a little bit where we left off yesterday with Lori. She had been homeschooling her children, and then she sort of transitioned them to Christian school as they got a little bit older, and all of a sudden she had some free time on her hands. Well, she did a lot of praying, and she decided to start her own business. She had a great love for children and family, and she loves to encourage moms out there. So she decided to do a tutoring business, and that seemed to be a perfect fit. So that's kind of where we left off. And I just want to start today by saying this, Lori, homeschooling in and of itself is a huge endeavor. And that's what you had been doing. So in my opinion, you know, if you can accomplish that, you're already one of my heroes, right? <laughs> but, but stepping out into the greater community and starting something brand new, it must have been not only exciting, but did you have some good old fashioned entrepreneurial fear along with that? And if so, how'd you handle that? Absolutely, I did. Oh, yes. And th some that I wasn't expecting. Um, yeah, it was my first time that I really did anything outside the home where I was contributing in a different way. So it was a big step. Uh, just professionally, I hadn't been teaching in a classroom for so long. So it's been a really it was a little rusty on that side of it. But I knew in uh, really what my giftings were. And I felt sure about that, that I love children. I love families. I love love young moms. I love pouring into them. And so I took what I did know about myself and with, uh, you know, this is where having a husband and wife speak into your life is so important that at that time, I just was constantly going to David, like, do you think that I could do tutoring? Do you think I should go back into student teaching? Like, what should I do? And, you know, when your husband and wife knows you so well, they just continue to breathe that confidence in you. Yes, you love this. This is what you come alive doing. And this is where you get super excited when you start talking about children and learning and pouring into them. So for one, having him pour that into me was huge, gave me a lot of confidence because I was nervous. But then another thing was how much do I charge? What are the practicals right. of what that looks like. And I didn't know really. So I, at that time, I just called several different friends that I knew that were business minded. And I said, you know, this is what I'm offering. I'm thinking about 45 minutes to an hour. Do you think this is too much? And so I started yeah. at a number and it was so funny. The first conversation I had, my friend was like, 
heck no, that's too little. Like, you don't, you need to charge more. And, and I was like, really? And she said, yes, you have a college education. And she kind of reminded me of the qualifications that I did have that I kind of, you know, forgot like, yeah, that is kind of a big deal. I, I am qualified to do it. I could do it. And so I think that was one of the most instrumental calls was when I called a couple of girlfriends and one of them really did almost laugh at the price that I put out <laughs> at first. And yeah. she said, you can name your own price and you're worth it. So I was like, okay, I can do this. That's so great. yeah, I yeah. was a little nervous, but I think with exploring it through some other business minded friends and family, and of course my husband, um, it became more and more clear that I've never done anything like this and I'm a little nervous, but I, I do know that I love it. And so that'll come through. And I remember the first tutoring session, I really didn't have all my ducks in a row. I was really pulling together what I thought would be best for that first session. But as you know, you learn as you go. And so I just poured everything I had into that first session. And there were some things that I was like, yep, I'll change this for sure. And then other things I was like, yeah, I can, I can, I can stick with this, the, the basic, you know, skeleton of what I'm doing and then add and take away from there. And so I think the biggest thing is just jumping in because I really wasn't ready completely. I, I've never set up things like FreshBook accounts that help me manage mm-hmm. it all. And this was all a learning curve. And so just getting my feet wet and doing it was the most important thing. And then I've learned so much from there. Yeah. Well, I think if if any of our listeners out here are thinking about starting a business like this, one of the greatest things I picked up on is you got advice on pricing because that's the hardest part. And what I've noticed is we all tend to undervalue ourselves. Absolutely. And I remember with Tradeway, when we first started out, you know, we we did not have the pricing right. And I went to my friend Myron Golden and he helped us with that a great deal. I mean, totally, totally in a different ballpark of what we thought the value was. He said, no, the va- this is the value. And here's how you know that. So that's great advice. Um for all of our listeners to think about that, because you will tend to undervalue yourself and you need to get that price point where the value really is. That's right. And then, and another great point you made is like, it's okay to learn as you go, or let's put it this way. If you wait till you think your product or service is perfect, you will never start. Never. So if you just start, you can tweak it along the way and it will get better. It'll get better and better. That's, so that's right. awesome. It absolutely does. That's really cool. Well, I've heard my good friend, Dr. Myron Golden, talk about the fact that God has an assignment for all of us. And he sort of said that in the context of, you know, in the very beginning of Genesis, where God talks about himself, it says, and in the beginning, God created. So the first thing we learn about God is that he's creative. And then he comes and says, we're created in his image, which means we're creative, right? Yes. So when you were at the stage where you didn't really know what you wanted to do, but you know, you knew you wanted to do something. How did you go about knowing what your assignment was? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, it took a little bit of floundering um, because my uh, my normal operation was take care of my kids. You know, the home. I've got that. I can do that. And I I just was so familiar with that that. Then when that came to a close, I really did find myself floundering. I honestly felt a little purposeless for a little while. And I questioned the Lord a lot. Like, what is my value? I just don't know. Like, I feel like I can do this, but I'm not that good at it. I think as a mom too, sometimes when you're stepping out, you, you do, uh, moms are the hardest on themselves. And so you are constantly kind of nitpicking what, you're capable of. And I think what comes to mind is that verse where it talks about, you know, being thankful for all things for this is the will of God. And you really almost have to step back and start thanking God and and see like, thank you, God, that you've done this in my life. Thank you, God, that you've given me this skill or skill set. Thank you, Lord, that when I do this, I come alive. Or thank you, God, that when um, I am with children, for me in particular, I feel like I can just hone in on them and give them all the encouragement mm-hmm. they need. Thank you, God, that you gave me the gift of encouragement, even though I haven't felt like that's a really important gift at some points in my life, I realize now that's a huge gift to pass to others. People need it at certain times that really, when you step into their lives, it makes all the difference in the world. So I think when you step back and you're thinking about like your calling, 
your position, where you're supposed to be in life, it's good to step back and just start thanking God for what he's given you. Acknowledge him that he's good. He's, he's given you things that to be thankful for. And then you start there with a thankful heart. I feel like it does change your perspective that you do have things to offer this world. You do have a skill set. It might not look like anybody else's, but you start there because that's the will of God. And he will start to direct you and lead you in that. And I think think also just seeing what makes you come alive and gets you excited and motivated. Uh, what brings a smile to your face when you start thinking about it. These are all things that you know don't drain you, but they give life to you. And God does that because you're, he gives you those capabilities so that then you can just pour those into others. So I feel like once you start thinking, how can I bless others? How can I make someone's life better? What can this look like if I take what I have and pass it on? And how will that enhance them? You, you, you're, it just almost like starts breeding this um, kind of all these bright ideas like, okay, I could do this. I could do this. And it's uh, like a snowball effect. And then you start kind of narrowing it down at that point to, okay, I do know what I'm gifted in. I'm thankful for these things God has gifted me in. And I'm going to just start with that. Wow. That's a great answer. Cause I, I'm sure we got a lot of listeners out there you, that might be right at the stage where you were, mm. where they're ready to branch out and do something different. And they're trying to figure out, well, what's my assignment? What does God want me to do? And then you just gave a great outline for how to do it. That was fantastic. Well, let me follow up with this. After you went through that whole process and and you kind of started thinking you knew what to do and you had your husband coming back and saying, man, you'd be great at that and that sort of thing. Yes. How did, the, how did you then feel like you knew it was God's will for you to do this? Well, um, I started out just with one student that, I mean, the Lord just worked it out. I mean, I had decided that week before that I wanted a tutor. And then that next week, a teacher came to me. I was her assistant. And she said, yeah, this student's really struggling. I think her mom is going to pursue a tutoring company. And she wants to talk to you about it. And I said, okay, well, actually I'm thinking about tutoring. And I really had to throw myself out there because I had to use what I knew about this tutoring company and still keep it as an option for them. But I did know that if they worked with me one-on-one, -on -one, it would be better, you know? Yes. So I, I just... I took what I knew and I left them completely open to what they wanted to do. But I think with me, knowing I had a relationship already with these parents helped so much. And I think that's what happens when you're a community, which God wants us in community. It's it, it was a much easier transition to find the need and then meet it because we already had these relationships. So this mom who knew I love her, loved her child dearly, she's a lot more likely to listen to my advice because she knows I love her. So right. I, I remember talking to her about the options and saying, you could go with this company, but this is, I think the benefit here, but again, whatever you want to do. And, and she ended up taking a chance on you know, using me. So I feel like part of the knowing I was in that will of God was just seeing how everything fell together really for me in that short period of time. And I started getting lots of tutoring jobs just in that one um, semester from, I guess, mostly from references. So right. I think having community, having relationship with people really helps kind of assess. I mean, if nobody used me and continue not to use me, it might be a closed door that, okay, maybe I wasn't hearing, you know, mm -hmm. that this was the, the right thing, maybe not at this time, but I do feel like it started to kind of flow and things started happening fairly quickly. So I just ran with it. That's really cool. Well, I hear, I, here's what I hear you saying. I had um, two different mentors mm. that meant the most in my life, other than my parents, my dad, my grandfather, people like that. And what's interesting is they both independently, at, you know, separated by decades of time, told me almost the same thing on how to know God's will. They had four points and they were the same pretty much. I added, I added a fifth point. So let me run it by you and see, see if this is what happened. Um, first of all, do I want to do this thing? Because you know how the Bible says God puts the desires yes. in our hearts. All right. So do I want to do it? Secondly, do I have the wherewithal to do it? You know, mm. can, or can I get the wherewithal to do it? Yes. Because sometimes it takes some money to launch something mm -hmm. uh, and other things you have to put together. And so do I want to do the thing? Do I have the wherewithal to do it? And, and thirdly, does it contradict scripture anywhere? Well, obviously your idea did not. Mm -hmm. And and then fourthly, do I have a peace about it? Yeah. In my heart. 
But the fifth thing that I added is when you go through those things, if they're affirmative, then take a step. Yes. So that's what you did. You just, the first step you took was you talked to this child's parents and the door opened and you stepped through it. Mm -hmm. And then the rest happened. And that's, that's, right. that's exactly, to me, that's exactly how you know it's God's will. And like you said, God could have closed the door if he didn't like it and opened a different one. But that's so right. You, so you stepped through it. You took a step. So you guys listening, think about that, because I think the biggest weakness in Americans, if we look at ourselves, we are not taught entrepreneurial thinking anymore. And unless you have parents or grandparents that put that in you, you, you have to start over because no one in your family taught you to think like that. That's so right. the first thing to, to realize is you have to take a step sometimes, even when it may not be real comfortable. You ha- If you don't take the step, you will never find it. Yeah, I think that's one thing with taking a step into these businesses is no one prepares you for that real scared feeling you feel when it's about yeah. to start. Yeah. And and that's okay. You know, that's really normal. Like I remember about to call this mom thinking, wait, what am I doing? I'm about to offer up my, you know, like my own business basically. And I haven't really given it as much like prep as I probably would have wanted to, which I probably would have been in a decision gridlock if I would have, because I'm not a great, like David's really good at that. Like I'm really indecisive at times. So I could see myself going back and forth, but no one prepares you that you're, you are going to feel that shocker at first, like, am I really doing this? Like, did I prepare enough? Did I plan enough? And you certainly haven't, you know, not enough that you're going to be able to say, I've thought of everything. You can't. Right. If you wait till then, you'll never do it. Never. You really won't. Yeah. You'll start to get scared of all the things, reasons why you shouldn't do it. (laughs) Yeah. Well, the way brother Myron put it to us, he said, look guys, don't wait till your product is perfect. Just get something built or get a service built and start offering it. And then you can make it better later or you'll never start. And that's so so true. true. So you went through the same feeling. I understand. I'm glad you took the step. Well, well, let me ask you, I'm going to change directions a little bit here. Um, So when you did take that step, I would imagine some things changed a little bit at home. So do you have any advice for women in particular that may be about to launch out as an entrepreneur on finding sort of the work life balance and how that changes a little bit. Do you have any, any tips or tricks you could share with them about that? Yeah, that's a great question. I I kind of fell into some tips and tricks because I'm not a type A planner by nature. I am more in the moment. And so I did have to learn the hard way that when you are taking extra time doing something outside the home, then it takes a little more preparation um, beforehand to really make things run smoothly. So for instance, I've adopted a Sunday afternoon slash night planning time. And it really is for looking over the calendar, seeing which days are my later days, what I'm doing for dinner that night, what the kids' sports schedules are like, how are we going to make sure, because dinner's a priority to us to try to all sit down for dinner and be together. So it really took a lot of planning on my end on Sunday. And actually, I shouldn't say a lot. It just took a really decided effort that on Sundays, this is kind of my time to, I have to discipline myself to sit down and look at that week ahead. Even if I think I know what's ahead, even if I've done it a lot of times before, it doesn't matter because every time I look at that calendar, I remember something new I didn't think of, or maybe these two things don't fit. And it really did save me a lot of time of running out to the grocery store, eating something fast, um, trying to collide two schedules. And then I don't have time that I need at home with the kids or with David. So I would say it's not a lot of time, but just really being disciplined and, and really planning your week ahead of time for me was huge. Um, because when you're planning ahead, you really are choosing to take that time up front and you're not going to lose it for the rest of the week. Cause you really can't get that back. And if you're constantly feeling behind the ball, it is, it's discouraging. You'll probably give up faster. Hmm. So for me, planning ahead, looking ahead and being disciplined enough to do that has been huge. Wow. That's great advice. I mean, I don't know how many people will have listening that are just about to attempt to launch out in this. And, and, uh, if they hadn't thought about that part now they can, that's really good advice. Well, you know, I think back uh, about my school days. I remember vividly my first grade teacher 
then the next teacher had two grades. I was with this one for second, third grade, and then the next one was fourth through sixth because I was in a little small country school. But they're like heroes to me in my whole life. I think about them often, and um, they're, they're in heaven now, but I think about them often. And then there were a few in high school, one or two, you know, and then one or two in college. But the ones that do come back to my memory are like heroes. So what does it feel like? to know that you will be a hero for many of these children for the whole rest of their lives. They'll remember you till the day they die. What does that feel like? Is that pretty cool? It is so cool. I love it. I, I honestly, when I see them, they, they give me so much joy. It's, it's reciprocal. Like when I see them, I feel so fulfilled because half, I would say more than half, 75% of my tutoring is encouragement and, and really breathing life to them. Cause usually if you need some kind of tutoring, you're, you're not learning as like everybody else in the classroom, which no one is meant to learn exactly the same. Right. So, you know, you're already maybe feeling a little bit under uh, subpar in some ways, maybe discouraged, even as a first grader, kindergartner, you can feel that. And so I, I just get so much fulfillment with having them come to my table and greeting them with a huge smile. They, they, I can tell it fills their love tank so much that it reminds me of my teachers. Like you're saying, when I see them look at me and I know they love me because I've showed them love Um, I I think of my teachers that did the same for me, that loved me, that really gave me, inspired me to want to read more or inspired me to want to, you know, love a subject more. And it's just so full circle. It, to me, it really takes me back to those teachers, like you said, but then I do think about like down the road, I hope they always remember that they were loved and they were special. And any time that I ever can, I'm telling them like, what God says about them and who God is for them. And, you know, that he loves them and his word, always trying to keep them bef- that before them. And it is, it is an exciting, awesome place to be with a child. Children are amazing. They bring me seriously as much joy as I can think my teachers have brought to me. They're, they're just so candid and real. And it kind of brings life kind of to a halt sometimes when I'm with them. Yeah. And you never know what they're going to say. <laughs> 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 That's so true. Well, I, I was going to ask you another question, but you answered it in that one. I was going to, I was going to say, well, do you ever get a chance to talk to them about spiritual things and how do you handle it? But, but you answered that you do it as you go. And if it comes up, you just, you just deal with, you're not afraid to deal with that. Right. Oh, oh I my mean, goodness. You, it's like a have, privilege. It's like an open door, isn't it? Oh, it is. And they're so honest and real that they, you know, yeah. you can really, and, and which is a huge responsibility. Cause I also think about all the kids I don't get to that are not encouraged by teachers or others that don't yeah. love God, that really hate him. And it, and it breaks my heart really. Like really? I would love to work with those kids someday. Well, you never know that might open up. You're not working with public school kids yet, right? I'm not. Christian no, I've started at the school that my kids were at because it was the easiest yeah. schedule wise to do. But, you know, if God opened that door, you wouldn't be afraid to branch out there because think oh, of no. the possibilities as far as witnessing. But then like, you know, you, you would have to be careful out there because a parent might come after you. You just don't Absolutely. know. But, you know, God take care of you, right? Yeah, he can take right. care of you. Well, Lori, I know we're running out of time here, but let me ask you one last question. This has been great information for anybody starting any kind of business. But if we've got listeners who might be thinking about starting a business specifically in education, what advice would you give them? Um, I would say that you just have to have an absolute love for children and a love for families if you do. If you don't, it's probably not the business for you because you're not going to get paid very much. And it's really a huge ministry. Um, it's long hours and little pay, but what I would say is when you're fueled by your passion to do something, it really brings so much joy that that's, what's going to carry you. And I would say there's a real deficit in our world today of teachers that want to impart real truth and real education to kids these days. And that needs to happen on a very base level. We're so busy in schools today talking about 
political things and uh, sexualizing things that have no place in school. So if you do have a heart for kids and for families, um, there is such a deficiency. It would be such a great calling for your life because kids need good teachers. We all know how they've influenced our own lives. And we just know how you spend most of the day with your teachers in and out if your kids are going to school. And so who is speaking into their life is so important. Well, Lori, thanks for that. That is amazing information. And not just for people who want to go into education, but for any kind of business, because what I hear you saying is that the thing that should drive us is the passion we have for the thing we're doing and the joy that comes with it. That's what carries us through. It is true, though, that we need more teachers that are not just doing it as a job, but they're doing it from the heart. So you made such a great point there. But you know what? That can translate into any kind of business, because if we're not doing it from the heart, we're going to burn out and it's just not going to work that well. So that is fantastic information. Thank you so much for sharing all the steps you went through and the mindset that you had and all that, because it's going to be such a help to so many of our listeners, because you gave like a step-by-step blueprint for how to start a business. And you also talked about how to stay motivated and keep going and doing it from the heart. I loved it. Well, Lori, thank you so much for being with us. We're going to have to do this again sometime. Yes, definitely. Thank you. You bet. All right, guys, don't forget to register for our Word on Investing Virtual Summit coming up April 22nd and 23rd. You're going to hear from Lori. You're going to hear from her husband, David Benham, and his brother, Jason. You'll hear from me, Dr. Myron Golden, Shane Sams, and many others. It's just going to be an awesome event, so you really don't want to miss it. Register for your free ticket at tradeway.com slash summit. That's tradeway.com slash summit. And join us on Monday for a fantastic episode with Rance Mayshack. He was the lead developer for Charts by Tradeway. So get ready for a super interesting discussion about the stock market and all the cool things you can do with Charts by Tradeway and how you can use this powerful tool on your trading journey. This man has an incredible background and a brilliant mind, and I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. We'll see you then.